welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Papp. I'm joined by Sam Friedman, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government and a former Policy Advisor at the Department for Education. I've asked Sam on the show this time as he's recently written an excellent piece about why apparently obvious policy ideas so often keep on failing to happen. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hello, nice to be here. Now, unusually for guests on this podcast, Sam, you're not a professor, at least not yet, maybe I should add. So no, I'm to... not. I'm not. But my parents both are and my wife is. So like, I feel like that, that gets me honorary professor. Yeah. You're, so. you're professor adjacent. I'm professor adjacent. Yeah. Yes. Apologies for not. I, I don't have the patience to actually be an academic. Would you like to just say a little bit about your policy background and expertise before we plunge into talking about your recent piece? I have been in, hanging around Westminster for a very long time, started in think tanks, Ended up as an advisor to Michael Gove, working at the Department for Education between 2010 and 2013. Also, of course, with some Lib Dem ministers, being as it was coalition at the time. Then left, so got quite disgruntled and disillusioned with politics and left. So moved to sort of working for charities, worked for various charities, including the teaching charity Teach First, but still retained an interest in politics. A couple of years ago got quite ill, left sort of my my full-time job and started writing about politics and policy for various different newspapers and magazines and my own Substack, which is where the piece you're talking about appeared, which I do with my dad called Comment is Freed. So please do check that out. And I'll include the link in the show notes for everyone. And yeah, definitely. It's well worth the read. I won't say whether it's your or your father's pieces I prefer. <laughs> Both excellent. Very different. Very. Different. He writes about foreign policy. I write about British politics. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so basically, I've now become a politics commentator, but with a sort of tend to focus more on on sort of policy rather than the day to day goings on in Westminster. And as I said, I'll include in the show notes the link in particular to your recent piece, which I thought had a fan- fabulous premise, which is that there are these apparently obvious policy ideas that people keep on saying, "Well, we should do." including mm. people who are in power saying what well, we should do and that they st- and then never end up happening and so you had I thought quite a nice schema of reasons as to why the apparently obvious doesn't happen so do you want to sort of run through what those are and then we'll maybe dive into each of them in turn a little bit yeah sure so the the idea for the piece came from I think both reading Patricia Hewitt's report on the health system and also sitting in the sort of millionth panel I've sat on where someone sort of says, oh, we should do more on preventative health rather than spending all our money on mm-hmm. managing the consequences of, of people being ill and sort of everyone sort of nodding and round of applause. And is well. these ideas that everyone agrees with and have agreed with for decades that just don't happen, because if you look at the reality, public health spending has been cut even while general health care spending has gone up. And I sort of think, well, actually, there's quite a lot of these types of ideas from from a whole range of policy areas. So why does that keep happening? And and I sort of came up with three three reasons why that why that keeps happening. What I call the policy po- paradox: the fact that these obvious ideas that've been around forever are the hardest ones to make happen. So the first reason was was around spending rules, uh, and and the way that we do make spending decisions in this country through 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 spending reviews. Uh, and, the, and the fact that it tends to be very short term. So preventative health is the is the classic example. There's always an emergency around hospitals. Hospitals always need more money. The Department for Health always want to show that they're getting more money for hospitals to because that's the sort of political motivation of their Secretary of State and the Prime Minister. We're putting more money onto the front line, more nurses, more doctors, etc., building more hospitals. But the Treasury is sort of always say, okay, well, if you want money for that, we're going to take it from somewhere. And preventative health is a good place to take that from, especially once, yeah, and, and they actually made it easier for themselves by moving the budget for, for public health into, into local government. And by doing that, they were able to say, cut it without cutting the NHS because it was now in a separate budget. So there's sort of all sorts of tricks they use to to find ways to manage public spending. And, and the prime minister and the different, different departments focus on maximising the most obvious types of public spending in their area so for the department for education it's schools and they will focus on school spending so the treasury moved further education out of the school's budget so they've cut further education and they can now say well we were protected schools mm. but it's a way of managing budgets whilst whilst uh, still saying you're protecting these sort of frontline services so there's a sort of the whole way in which we treat public spending and that there's a very very short-term attitude to public spending mit against mitigates against things that everyone thinks are sensible to do but don't have that kind of immediacy in the public mind. 
right? So that was kind of the first reason. The second reason was what I called misdiagnosis, which is where you get a an idea that pops up all the time and is and kind of based on a on a kernel of truth, but but misses the point, and therefore you keep getting politicians and others pulling at the wrong policy levers. The example I used for here for this one is vocational education. I'm sure we have all heard the phrase vocational education should have the same parity of esteem as academic education. The problem is we're all snobs and and we don't treat vocational education properly in this country. Again, we'll always get lots of nods, round of applause at a panel of them. But but it but it's just not not true because it's not within politicians' gift to give esteem. Esteem is not the problem. The, the, the fact is it's a rational calculation on behalf of parents and students that getting a degree from a university, going down an A-level route and getting a degree, if you can and are able to do and have the grades to do that, will likely make mean you earn more money. There is a premium to having a degree. So what happened is because they sort of obsessed with this idea of parity of esteem, politicians keep trying to redesign all the qualifications for vocational or education, we're doing it again now with T-levels, to try and make them as rigorous and as seen as being as publicly valuable as A-levels. But by definition, the cohort of young people who are prepared to do these qualifications are ones who can't do A-levels because people who can do A-levels want that graduate premium. And then they're too hard for that cohort, so they have to be made easier. And once they're easier, they don't have, you, know, you keep going around in the same circle. And we've done it over and over again for the last 30, 40 years. You know, the first report complaining that we didn't didn't value vocation education enough was sort of in 1851. And so we've been going around the circle forever uh, and not resolving it because it's a misdiagnosis. The problem isn't parity of esteem. The problem is that we keep changing the qualifications and we don't fund it well enough. If we funded further education properly, we had stable qualifications, it might not have parity of steam, but it would still be a good alternative route to, 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 to the academic. So then my and my third category of, of sort of reasons why the obvious policies don't happen was fear of the electorate. And here I use the example of council tax revaluation, where council tax is based on property valuations from 1991, uh, obviously a very long time ago. Since then, properties in part of the country, particularly London and the South East, have gone up a lot more than properties in other, other parts of the country. But we're still valuing everything based on, on those old valuations. It doesn't, no one can defend it. It is an indefensible position. There have been dozens of think tank reports, IFS, Resolution Foundation, saying this is obviously nonsense. But no politician wants to go near it because it would mean probably people in, in larger houses in London and the South East having to pay more money. And they feel that would be electorally toxic. So they never defend it. There are policies that you and I might think are stupid that politicians will nevertheless happily go out and argue for. Making laughing gas illegal was the one I used in the blog, where I'm sure most of your listeners would think, uh, that wasn't a good idea in terms of, and certainly the experts would say that it, it wasn't a, a sort of a good approach, but politicians will happily argue for it because there's strong public support for it. And you can make a case for it, you know, that there's antisocial behavior sort of as a result of people, young people using it in parks or whatever. But with something like counter tax revaluation, they don't even make an argument for it. No one defends it. It's just no one ever does anything about it. Everyone knows it's wrong, but there's this sort of fear of the electorate. There's probably quite a bit about sort of housing and housing policy that falls within that category where sort of everyone in Westminster knows that there's something that, that, that sort of they want to happen, but but they're fearful of the electorate on it. So those are my three reasons right, for this policy yeah. paradox. I, I, I fear if any listener had, say, the last Liberal Democrat general election manifesto in front of them, as you were saying that, it would have felt like quite a d demolition job of sort of scoring out pages of stuff. Because in a way, I think the, the instinctive answer from a lot of Lib Dems has often been, well, there's this idea that we've been banging on about for years and years and years, but that's because the electorate hasn't yet, in its wisdom, <laughs> elected the Lib Dem majority government. So it was really interesting, you know, you coming at this from a different perspective, in a sense, seeing mm. a very similar pattern. I mean, thinking about the spending rules one first, mm. I mean, what that made me think about was this problem of short-termism in politics, because in a way, a lot of the problems that both you and others, I think, rightly highlight are around both spending and taxation decisions made with a very short-termist perspective, partly because not very many ministers are around for more than a couple of years, governments have to worry about elections and, and so on. And I always think the best, smartest, probably, policy move of, of my lifetime, actually, maybe, was economists getting their head round what we need to do is to advocate for independent central banks, because if interest rates are shipped by short-termist 
political instincts as opposed to long-term economic interests, you get worse policy. And the temptation is too big. You have to remove the temptation. And therefore, and I think generally independent central banks, although some have had better and worse records, have worked really well as a policy move. That It's taken that temptation away. And of course, we tried to take temptation away in lots of other areas of life, such as should chocolates and other lovely but maybe not quite healthy foodstuffs be at tills in shops or indeed with pensions having default opt-in to pension schemes so we've got lots of ways that we try to take temptation away from people in order to serve longer term interests but it strikes me we don't talk very much about how else you know, what's the next thing after independent central banks what's the next way of removing temptation so do you have any thoughts on if you were let loose in the mm. 10 Downing Street policy unit, what would you be, what temptations would you be finding ways to put out of reach? So I think it's a really great point. And I think you're right that the moving independence of the Bank of England was an absolutely critical moment when the sort of, the, the, until that point for, for several decades, we'd had interest rates shooting up and down all the time as, as as governments tried to manage the election cycle using interest rates and tried to sort of create booms just before elections. And that putting that out of reach was was really critical in creating a more sort of initially more stable sort of economic environment and and, and creating a a bank that was able to respond to sort of more recent crises as well. The other thing that sort of falls into that category is the creation of the OBR, which was George Osborne mm. in 2010 created the OBR. He he thought it was a clever political wheeze against Labour, a future Labour government, because it, it would mean that they couldn't fiddle the figures and, and they would have to be sort of honest about how much was being spent and what the, the sort of state of the public finances. It ended up upending some of his own colleagues in, in sort of tr Trust and Quarteng uh, when they refused to publish mm. an OBR report. And I think that kind of showed the how... The, 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 that's now become a sort of expectation very quickly of of of, of the markets of of, of, of of politics that the OBR is that sort of critical independent check that that sort of stops politicians being tempted to fiddle the figures. So you sort of got two two probably two of the best economic policies of the last thirty years have both been in that in that field. So what could you do that would allow that to happen? So. One idea that, I mean, David Gork, the former Treasury, Tory Treasury Minister, has talked about is having sort of an office of spending where, which sits sort of independently and outside the Treasury, a bit like the Office of Budget Responsibility. But rather than sort of looking at whether the figures add up, what they would be doing is looking at proposals from departments on spending. Because the problem that we've got is that health department will say we should spend more on preventative health but we can't stop spending on hospitals but in the long run that will save money and the department for education will say you know, we want to spend more money on early years education in the long run that will save you money but not right yet and the justice will say we want to spend more on rehabilitation in the long run and everyone is making essentially the same argument to the treasury and if the treasury accepted all of those arguments well we, we'd run out of money very fast so and they don't really have a good way of balancing it. So they just kind of say no to everything. And they just have a sort of ideological no assumption that, that that's that's not true. And there's no point trying to sort of make these investments that pay off in the long term. If you had an independent office to review the evidence for any of those claims, rather than it being a sort of ritual fight between the department and the treasury, I think you you would get you know, sort of public assessment of whether there was a strong case. Actually, yes, if we invest in childhood obesity, that is going to save money in the long run, allow you to spend a bit more on that because you've got that independent sign off. The markets would be fine with it because it's going to save money in the long run. And there's independent verification of that. So it would be a way of allowing some of these projects to happen in, in a very transparent public way. And I really like that idea. I, I mean, I, I think it would need a lot more working up and thinking through, but I think that kind of principle of the more transparent and the more, in, while still leaving the ultimate decision with the democratically elected politicians, the more transparent mm -hmm. you can make the decisions, the 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 less opportunity is there there is to take stupid ones. And I, I, I think one of the sort of themes running through what we've said in that sense is very much a focus on the economic and the financial side of things, which obviously, particularly in the last few years, is, is a really crucial element of public policy, particularly with the huge financial strain that so many bits of the public sector are under. But I wonder if you wake up to discover yourself the CEO of an organisation outside politics, 
that was beset with a short-termist culture. There's a whole set of other things around moving from annual plans to three-year plans. How long do people stay in post? There's a whole set of other things that you would look at. And it strikes me that there's no inherent reason why ministers' terms of office, for example, are just completely subject to the whim of the prime minister, as opposed to it being the norm that you are appointed minister for uh, the rest Mm. of the parliament or for three years. or There's this whole set of other cultural changes that uh, people are really used to doing if you're trying to turn around an organisation that's short-termist, but that just don't seem to register on the sort of political radar at all or is my political radar too faulty that I'm not spotting all of these clumps of really interesting conversation that's happening about this no I mean I think I think I mean again it's one of those there's a lot of so I'm writing a book at the moment or try, attempting to write a book at the moment on, on sort of why the British state doesn't work very well so it's a very big topic <laughs> lots to cover but this was theme of short-termism does keep coming up and what's odd is that there's so many of these things and you give the example of ministerial appointments which is something I will I will write about it's incredibly that ministerial churn is higher in the UK than I, almost any other democratic country in the world. And, and everyone knows it's a problem, right? You talk to anybody, you, you mention it to anybody and they'll say, yeah, it's really stupid. But it doesn't occur to anyone to try and fix it. It's like we're all swimming in this sort of sea that we don't feel we can change when actually we have quite well. Prime ministers, certainly governments have quite a lot of power to think differently. It's just that they ne- it never occurs to them to do so. They're always dealing with the day to day problem mm-hmm. and the priority always seems to be our NHS waiting lists or cost of living or whatever the big issues or immigration, whatever the big issues of the day are. And they never sort of think, well, actually, if we fix some of this machinery that sits around our decision making process, it would be a lot easier to solve these day to day problems. But but that, that requires a sort of distance that I think a lot a lot of the time you, the politicians don't have because they're sort of so, so in, immersed in this sort of rapid day to day decision making about whatever crisis is going on right now. But yeah, ministerial appointment is a great example. Why Why is it that we have this sort of ridiculous show? Why do we have so many ministers? We don't need so many ministers. Well, we I know why. It's because they're patronage opportunities. But that raises a whole other sort of set of questions. We don't use ministerial office in a very sensible way. And there's no real attempt to align office with any level of expertise that one might have in, in that topic either. So if you have both rapid churn and you're not trying to put people who know anything about that topic in the post... Well, by the time they've figured out what the hell they're supposed to be doing, they're moved. So it's a system that's inevitably going to fail. Lots more we could say on that, but maybe we should move on to the second of your three points, the misdiagnosis one. And I guess this is the one that I I think maybe I found not necessarily least persuasive, but it seemed to most jar with sort of other thoughts, which is that one of the sort of other common complaints about politics, the sort of version of the short-termism, but also that applies very much, I think, to the media and the policy think tank world, as well as the sort of more formal elected politics spheres, is just our love of something new. Policy think tanks, almost by definition, and newspapers, almost by definition, are always wanting something new to say. And it's it's almost like we're addicted to always having something different, always having a new initiative, always having a new angle to talk about, which would suggest that any misdiagnoses would get swept away in the wave of people wanting to talk about new things uh, Mm. relatively quickly and that there might be misdiagnoses all the time, but they wouldn't be the same ones that hang around for such a long time. So why do you think that cult of newness doesn't at least give us that a beneficial side effect of sweeping away? I mean, I think I don't actually think they're contradictory because I think Westminster has such a short term memory that it doesn't Mm. realise that a lot of things (laughs) we're thinking new are actually not new at all. Mm. So it's like every Secretary of State for Education comes in thinking that it's an incredibly innovative idea to talk about vocational education qualifications and how they're going to make them how they're going to make them work better and and sort of create power of steam. And they always sort of assume they always seem to think that a lot of their predecessors have only been fixated on the academic and they've spotted this hole that that, that, that that no one else has thought of. And I think you kind of get that in lots of policy areas. Ideas keep coming around. Once you've been around for as long as both of us have, you sort of see the same idea come round and round with people thinking that they're having some sort of uh, innovative thought. The other example I used in that section was around targets, where over and over again, you'll get a minister or a advisor or a think tank thinking they've had some amazing insight by saying oh ah but you've created you, this target has a perverse incentive you know if this target is, is, is sort of being gamed by people and you're like yes targets are always gamed by people that that does happen but that doesn't mean the target is necessarily 
worse than not having a target. It's, um, exactly. So again, that's the misdiagnosis. Is so people people keep thinking they're discovering these new insights, but actually they're old insights and they didn't work last time. And, it, and you need to sort of understand and go back and understand why it didn't work last time to but realize. Why do new ministers that. not know that? So I mean, I think you're right that there is a there's there's not that much of a political institutional memory in many ways because of the churn of ministers and so mm. on, but. Now, when ministers come into their job, most of them get pretty decent support from their civil servants. They've got lots of expertise, often with a lot of institutional knowledge. Institutions like the Institute for Government do a really interesting set of induction sessions for new ministers as well. Lynn Featherstone, you know, one of the Liberal Democrat ministers in 2010 to 15 government, you know, in many ways, repeatedly sings the praises of one of the Institute for Government sessions and how actually what Andrew Donis and Michael Heseltine ran through in the session uh, that she was at basically set the course for her work figuring out well okay getting same-sex marriage legalized is a good thing to try to do and here is how I can go about doing it so those sessions seem to be genuinely really useful but not really delivering on reminding people that or pointing out effectively to people this new idea of yours actually isn't quite so new and has failed 17 times before yeah I think I mean it's partly it's of good good and bad ministers right good ministers will think about the history of their department that they've been put in, they will attend Institute for Government, so they'll be informed. But ministers mm. in any government are a pretty mixed bunch. You know, they have to be picked from a group of 300 plus MPs of varying quality who might not be particularly interested in the subject. And ministers have a sort of tendency to distrust institutions. I mean, we've seen that a lot in recent weeks. I think the civil services sort of have their own they're always trying to stop people doing what I want to do. And you get a lot of ministers who are very influenced by perhaps a small number of conversations with with, with friends or colleagues mm. and come in with this very sort of strong view of what they want to do that isn't based on an awful lot and often is exactly this, is often based on a sort of misunderstanding of the history of a policy area. And then it's, but it's quite hard to do, once they've sort of made a public mm. announcement, this is what they plan to do and they're going to be the minister who's going to sort vocational education or whatever. Uh, it's quite hard to then divert them from that course mm. because they've sort of made a political commitment. And I think sometimes you get ministers who sort of learn along the way that perhaps they shouldn't have made the commitment, mm. but they tried <laughs> to the commitment. Yeah. I, so turning to the fear of the electorate, your sort of third mm. point. I mean, in many ways, I mean, I'm tempted to turn sort of all populist and have a bit of a rant <laughs> about how this is the, a really good fear to have. We want politicians to be fearful of the electorate. We don't want them to be fearful of the whips or their large donors or the mates they went to school with. We want them to be fear, fearful of the electorate. That's what a democracy is, is about in many ways. It's that your fate is determined by non-politicians. So I I always sort of, and, and I, I always think housing is a really good example of this, that to my mind, one of the main stumbling blocks with tackling the housing problem in Britain is that there is not enough political support in the planning system for getting more houses built and that that's the fear that politicians are often running from mm. but the answer to that surely is to think of it in that sense just like a political campaign or an election you've got some people who might be opposed to housing who you need to find a way to persuade them to be in favor of housing so rather than as it were run away from them fearfully or denigrate them all as as nimbyists, you actually need to find ways of persuading them, which to me sounds self-evidently obvious. And it's in a sense like avoiding the mistakes that say some Remain campaigners made of viewing anyone who was supporting leave as they're necessarily being racist. Some of them were, but for lots of other people, actually there were points that you could engage with. And sadly, the Remain campaign didn't manage to engage successfully, but you can hope to change things in the future by engaging with those people whose views are up are up for grabs. But I was looking at, for example, the Shelter website just before we started recording. They've got lots of reports on there about ways to fix the housing problems in Britain. But even their report that I was looking at that delved into problems with the planning system, it was all about things like changing the rules around the infrastructure levy and so on, and not about, okay, who are these people who oppose new housing in their community? What actually motivates them? What actually are the things that might persuade them? Whilst by contrast, and, you know, obviously I'll give a Lib Dem example. If you look at Lib Dem councils like Eastleigh, which have done really well at getting housing built, 
it's been all about saying, OK, your concerns around, say, infrastructure, we will we'll engage on that and we'll get the infrastructure built you know, at the same time or in parallel with the housing. So you've got confidence that, that the community will have the extra GP that it needs. It will have some shops so that people can actually get get food when they need it. And so, you know, all of those. And, and I just think that the fear of the electorate is just I mean, you're right, is very prevalent. But I guess is of the reasons the one that I have the least sympathy with, because I just think your job is to win over the, you know, if you're a politician, your the, job is to win over the electorate. That's the point. I mean, I don't, I don't have sympathy with it. I was just trying to sort of explain mm. what happened. I, no, absolutely, I think, yeah. And I think that I, I would distinguish between fear of the electorate mm. and respect for the electorate. Mm. Like, it's absolutely critical for any democratic politician to have respect for the electorate and to not sort of be dismissive mm. towards them. If they are, they're not going to stay in power for very long, nor should they. And, you know, the example you give of, of the Remain campaign is good. I think they didn't respect the electorate enough. And to understand why they might be unhappy with certain policy proposals. But I think one of my biggest frustrations with politics at the moment is rather than do that, they'll look at a poll, say, well, there is this doesn't poll well, we're not going to do it. Rather than say, OK, well, why doesn't it poll well? Mm. It is important that we do this, but it doesn't poll well. So why? Let's understand it. Let's persuade. Let's win the argument. Let's show some leadership. And I feel like whether on every topic, whether it's Brexit, immigration, economy, housing, there's a sort of sense that, well, the public aren't signed up now. So we're just going to we're going to lie to them. Essentially, we're going to be dishonest and pretend that you can you can you can these sort of trade offs that exist don't exist. That You can have a Brexit that works or you can have sort of low immigration and a faster growing economy or you can have you know, whatever it is because they don't want to engage. They don't want to make the argument. And I think cancer tax revaluation is a relatively small point in the scheme of things, but I think it's a classic example. Everyone knows it's wrong. People know it will be unpopular. No one wants to make the argument. No one wants to take any leadership on it. And I do think that's one of the reasons why the public are so unhappy and miserable about politics at the moment. They, they, they look at the situation the country is in. They look at the political parties and they say, well, you're not taking any leadership. Yeah. You, you, but tell I, us, you don't want to hear, right? Yeah, tell us, council tell us tax revaluation, I think, is a really good example. As you say, it's a relatively small thing in the overall scheme of things, but I think it's a really nice example because you're right that you can absolutely come at this from a straightforward policy perspective of clearly it is nonsense that the way our property-related tax is worked out is based on the valuations of property several decades ago and the valuations are just getting more and more out of date. But I think the there's a there's a very to me at least very straightforward obvious political problem which is that although we know that revaluing all the properties doesn't then mean everyone's taxes go up because actually if you've got a larger council tax base and the council is still raising the same amount of money in council tax it means some people's bills relatively will go up other people's bills relatively will will fall because in itself revaluing doesn't mean that you're putting up the council tax but there's quite a few steps, both in terms of time and process and decision maker between an inspector's turning up to your property to decide that it's valued at a much larger figure for the purpose of future council tax mm. calculations through to you eventually getting the council tax bill and mean it, realizing that doesn't mean that your council tax mm. bill has gone up by the same amount. And so I think the the, 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 the lack of linkage between revaluation and bill, or rather the fact that it's an extended linkage... That's that's that seems to be it's inevitable that's going to cause all sorts of political worries and concerns. And the answer is to find a way of doing revaluation that addresses those linkages. And yet, at least in terms of what I've seen of people in the past say about revaluation, it's like they just stop at the that, well, of course, this is the right thing to do, and don't then follow through in a way that environmental campaigners, I think, are really good. You know, environmental yeah. campaigners overall, if you talk with them read their stuff etc it's all full of why does the public not support x what are the reasons how might we address it what are the policies that might help and there's obviously very different views that different environmental campaigners pull from the evidence like whether extinction rebellion rebellion style campaigning is useful or not but it's all based on that sense of how do we persuade people so i i, I do think it's that there's a bit to which the policy sort of think tank world has a degree of responsibility here of just of being too detached in some ways from from the reality of politics is about persuading people 
Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that was one of the core messages I was trying to get across mm. in the piece. As I've said, at the, right at the end, I say the, it's taken me a long time to realise, but ideas are overrated in policy. And the mm. real scale is finding out how to make the ideas we already have happen. And whether that is, you know, dealing with the kind of problems of short termism we were talking about at the beginning or defi- devising sort of clever ways to understand and persuade pu- the public of, of the sort of value of something. Now that's We don't do anywhere near enough of that. We do too much of kind of like, what's the brilliant new idea that's going to, we actually know a lot of the, like we know a lot of things we need to do as a country, but, but it, 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 it's making them happen. That's, that's difficult. I mean, and housing, which you were talking about before is a, is another great example. We, we do need more houses. Uh, I think most people would accept that. I do think, and, and I can certainly understand the anger amongst millennials and, 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 younger people that that it keeps being blocked and this sort of sense of nimbyism and frustration of nimbyism but actually that is not a constructive way to solve the problem yeah. you do have to think okay but 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 what why what why is nimbyism such a powerful political uh, response to things why do people feel so defensive about that they're not all idiots they're not all selfish there is there are reasons why people yeah, whether it's the developments look horrible, whether it's the fact that they are genuinely worried about their primary school or their GP. Yeah, maybe they are worried about their environment. That's fine. You know, that's a reasonable concern people to have. So how do we persuade people? The national need for more houses means that we do need to build in their area and we can mitigate their concerns. And I do, and I kind of agree with you. I am a bit more, I, naturally a bit more skeptical of the Lib policy on this issue than you <laughs> You being being one and be not, but I, I like I do think like that that the element of the local and the local control is absolutely critical. Like re, just bringing back national targets may may give you a short term boost, but it's not really going to long term solve the problem. You need to create that kind of local ownership and understanding of why it matters. Yeah, I mean the the national targets thing is a is I think a good example of actually one of the things that is very hard for politicians to judge, mm. which is I think on housing targets. It feels to me like, yeah, they're important and all political parties should have a housing target and so on. But it's not the absence of a housing target that is fundamentally the problem with fixing the housing problem in Britain or indeed what the number has been. We've had decades of targets being set and so on. So while the target has a bit of a value, the problem is really the implementation how do you actually then deliver on on your target? And if you set a target that, you know, as, as we've seen in recent years, if you set a target that local people are really unhappy with and creates massive political pushback, eventually the pressure will get so great as the Tories have done, you end up cancelling your targets in a panic with no plan for what to do next and housing numbers collapse. So again, like there's a, there's a sustainability question here. How do you get people to kind of want the houses? Yeah. But, but I am struck that, you know, there is, and I'm sure there has been some coverage of the sort that I'm about to sweepingly say doesn't exist at all but I think it's generally true to say that you don't get housing think tanks producing reports about well these are the four focus groups we did with residents of villages in green belts where residents recently lobbied their planning committee mm. to get get developments blocked we don't get focus grouping of who are the people who are opposed and why we don't get the long read in the Saturday Guardian of one of their journalists going and spending time talking to people who are campaigning against the development to understand exactly what you know I find it just the more I think about it the more frustrating it is that it's like at times the worst version of of pro-European campaigning of well if they don't agree with us they're awful and there's nothing in terms of substance that we can engage with as opposed to let me give you a really trivial example if I wanted to pick a super trivial policy idea one of the problems I think that's that makes people reluctant to see increased densification, so more floors on buildings in urban areas where you often sort of think, well, actually, this area could all be four storeys rather than two storeys. And that's one thing is just the fact that if you've got a whole set of flats on a high street, where do people put their rubbish out? They end up sticking bags messily by the lampposts. A fox at night gets at the bags and you just have litter strewn streets. And it just it feels like both because of the litter, but also the general impression that it gives, like you're just cramming too much housing into an area than cope with it. But actually there are some quite interesting sort of innovative things that some councillors are starting to do now about dealing with where do you put your bins out if you're you're living, say, in a flat above a shop and dealing with those sorts of litter problems. But that's the sort of thing that you only get into if you're listening to people and filtering out, well, are there some concerns here that we can address?
So what's what's the magic solution, Sam? How do we mm -hmm. get more of that sort of thought happening? I mean, I think, yeah, the, 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 this will be, I'm sure, not unfamiliar to your listeners as a solution, mm. but it, there is a massive problem with the, the level of centralisation in British politics. You mm. know, the fact that every decision is made in, in Westminster. You every... know how to pander to your audience. But I know, but I it's true. And I was just <laughs> writing a lot about it in the book is like this sort of, it is like the uh, problem of British politics that we are just so incredibly centralised that that you have this disconnect on every issue between between the, the local and, and and the national, and you have a very small group of of, of, of policymakers who sit in in, what, in Westminster and haven't have their own worldview, right? Most of them are pretty. Most of them are millennials who can't afford a house, right? So, they, so it's not surprising they'd all be like. This is a massive issue for the country and we need to start building and these people in rural areas need to stop whining. So it, it, it is just one of the many, many ways in which this incredible intense centralisation of British politics causes causes this disconnect and you don't have any local news coverage. So you, know, you have very, very cheap local news coverage. So you get the odd picture of campaigners holding up their banners yeah. next to the field and everyone goes, look at the NIMBYs. Yeah. But, but, but no, no sort of in-depth coverage of that because... It's not where not where the journalism is happening on the whole. There are some very good examples of local journalism, but not enough. And obviously, part of the answer as well will be for people to all go and buy and read your book when it comes out in it due. Comes course. out, which will not be for a while, next year sometime. But for the meantime, sign up to the Substack. Yeah, absolutely. I will include links to your Substack in the show notes. On that note, thank you hugely <laughs> for your time, Sam. Listeners can right. find Sam on Twitter at samfr which also includes links to his excellent email newsletter. And you can find myself on Twitter at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. Do look out in the show notes for follow-up links to Sam's newsletter and other things we've discussed. Mm -hmm.